Welcome back to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with me, Jeffrey Ken. And on today's conversation, I'm joined by Joshua Trott, the Chief Revenue Officer of WorkRise. And we're going to talk about supply chain challenges and issues in oil and gas, how the traditional way that the industry manages a supply chain actually creates and compounds uh, challenges that other industries have worked to solve. And uh, hopefully this will hold some lessons for participants in the industry to think more creatively about the supply chain and how to manage it uh, differently. Uh, so, uh, Josh, welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeffrey. Super excited to be here. And uh I think as you and I have talked about before, I'm deeply passionate about this problem, so excited <laughs> to jump in. Well, I, I think everyone who comes on this podcast is pretty passionate about the energy industry. You know, we're, we're, pre, we're all collectively quite dependent on it, and yet the narrative yeah. that prevails in society is that energy somehow is bad and that it's, it, it needs to be taken out of existence, and yet re reality is quite different. But we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, but, but to begin, though, I wonder if you just might set a bit of uh, provide us with a bit of context. How? Uh, what's your background, and how did you get into working in the, the energy industry? You, know, you work in a variety of, of industries, so why why this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've actually been in and around the energy and natural resources space for almost the entirety of my career. Uh, actually started helping to develop projects uh, for uh, coal in the mining industry, metallurgical coal specifically. Uh, and then over the course of my career, I moved into consulting. I did strategy consulting focused on the energy and specifically oil and gas and space uh, and even worked for a, an electric utility. And so I've seen kind of the whole spectrum of energy and markets. And, and now I uh, will get the, the chance to work at WorkRise, which is very much focused on energy and very specifically the oil and gas space, which is kind of where the company's from and deep within its DNA. Yeah. Let's let's turn to this question of the problem that, uh, you know, you're devoting your your life's work <laughs> to, to try and solve. You know, there's many problems yeah. out there. What's the problem here? Uh, this problem space is fascinating. Uh, and so when you dig into kind of how energy companies are operating and very specifically oil and gas, there's a there's a few interesting data points that start to pop up. Uh, one thing you'd expect them to be exceptional at is like delivering projects on budget. Uh, but we know through kind of interviewing and engaging with our client base that over 50 percent or I should say less than 50 percent of uh, these projects are actually delivered on budget. That seems odd. But when you start to double click into how they're actually having to run these projects and how they have cost visibility into those projects, it all actually starts to make a tremendous amount of sense. Like if you assume average time to complete uh, an onshore well and drill that is about 20 days, but the average time to get cost visibility is 60 to 90 days. You're flying blind. Well, most of the time, project, yeah. Completion wow. thing, yeah. And and so you start to look at like how often are invoices being disputed? I mean, that happens at a rate of fifty to sixty percent. That over half the time you're getting an invoice that doesn't accurately reflect the work that was done. Um, and so when you start to unpack the why here, it becomes really clear that the data that people are operating with on these yeah. projects is stale or sometimes non-existent. Uh, you would see, interesting enough, that most, the vast majority, like less than 20% of the total population, believe they have the information that they require to run their day-to-day -day operation. Which less is than, less than 20%. That is. And, and so you think about how advanced technologically yeah. this industry is with being able to think about offshore and what they can do in deep water, but they can't recognize how much money they've spent on a project that is live. Yeah. It is then no surprise that they have these challenges on budgets. But then the obvious question should be, well, why? Like, what is the root cause for this? Because, again, it is such an innovative industry, but this mm -hmm. one portion of it has somehow been frozen in time. And so when you click again and you kind of engage the industry and say, like, well, do you care about this? And the answer is, you know, always yes. Like, always over 50 yes. percent yeah. Yeah. Uh, of, these, of these companies are desperate to have a single source of truth yeah. on this information. And so what you end up seeing when you kind of bucket this all together, and this is like the number one operational challenge that we hear expressed from the participants in the industry, and again, this is no surprise, is that there is so much red tape and bureaucracy because of how they have to set up the systems to deal with all this lack of visibility that it just breeds slowness, a lack of agility, yeah. and ultimately a lack of reliability in being able to deliver these projects and unleash the, the power of the people that operate in this industry. Because again, the, the people that work in this industry are incredible, but they're hamstrung by the lack of information that they have at their fingertips. And so ultimately, what we seek to solve here is actually create an end-to-end -end supply chain solution that links all of that information together, but to put the power of that information in the hands of the industry participants, both the critically innovative and large and important 
players in the space that you see on the client side, as well as all of the supporting vendors that operate in the space that those clients depend on to get these projects done. And so we believe that the, the unlock here is actually not solving these individual pain points that exist throughout the supply chain, mm-hmm. but actually thinking about this as a holistic ecosystem. And how do you find that common thread, that golden thread, if you will, that empowers people to make great data-driven decisions? Because we know if they can do that, they will spend far more time and spend far more resources in the places that they need to, which is innovating and thinking about the problem you articulated at the top, which is a perception problem, not a reality problem. Like how do they actually drive innovation to enable the energy transition in that in that road that we have ahead, which is tricky. Uh, and so that's why we get passionate about this, because we believe if we can solve this problem. It puts the power of those solutions and the ability for them to go execute that in their hands. And that's what we believe our role is. We hope to be an enabler for this industry to move faster and with more certainty around the information that they operate off of. I, I, my sense is that, I mean, his, it, this is a reality of the industry, is, is that the, the money side of this industry, the financing of the commercial side, so purchase orders, um, invoices, cash, uh, runs completely separate from the actual service delivery. In other words, someone's on the ground doing work at a well, and there's a, the, and so that's the real work being done. Your commercial side's on its own set of rails. Uh, sh- that has to be a contributing factor here. The fact that uh, what you what you use to run the business at the front line, and then how you commercially uh, deal with it, um, are on separate tracks. I think that's a, a very insightful push, and I think that's right. And I think you see this culminate in even how we talk about pub- the publicly traded players in the yeah. space and how they're being pushed to think about shareholder value and returning kind of dividends and how that reinvestment, like, where is that going? Where could that go? Right. And then you speak to the field, you get to the people on the front lines Mm -hmm. and their problems and how they manifest are very specific and would seem on the surface, very solvable pain points. Uh, But that's not where it's not the sexy thing to solve. Right. And so (laughs) it's like that capital doesn't get deployed there. And like, if, if you think about what that problem looks like for, uh, someone that's in the field, they are struggling to identify who are the credible and qualified vendors that I can trust to do this job for the right price with the right safety and the right track record of execution. Yeah. I do a lot of stuff based off of handshake deals because I don't actually have the ability to see that. So I just work with the people I've always worked with. Trust. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going, and then, yeah, I'm going through a home renovation right now. And the whole thing has been based on which contractor do you trust to get the job done? And right. you know, it's all yeah. based on the personal uh, relationship, not necessarily right. a, a, a data-based um, uh, allocation of work to most qualified That's person right. at the moment to get the job done. That's right. And, and I think like it's important to unpack that because so much of this industry, if you've operated in it, it is not a bad thing that those trust-based relationships enable and drive the, the businesses forward. Yeah. But yeah. it is a question and like, how do you actually unlock and empower the vendors that are not the bad actors that are the actual ones that like are doing great work. And how do you showcase that information and get them in the hands of more like clients or more operators that can actually access those people? Because that's going to lift all boats, right? If we can, if we can rise that rise the tide there, you're going to see a huge impact on the ability for this industry to do what it needs to go do. Uh, And I think that's when you, when you start to ask questions of like, so like, who are you working with in the field? Mm -hmm. A lot of the times they actually even struggle to answer that question. Like knowing who's even out there in the world is like a real pain point for them where they're having to move so fast. They're having to try to like trust a bunch of people. And if you're at the top kind of overseeing some of these projects, a lot of that stuff gets lost in, in the, in the shop. Yeah, the right? translation, uh, yeah, true enough. Yeah. And then, and then I think that maybe this, the saddest statement is when you really push people on this idea of like, how would you describe the ability, like if you could to have everything in one system, uh, I've seen it, one client describe that as that sounds great, but that's a pipe dream. <laughs> and for me, being in and around this industry for so long, if that's the bar expectation, which is like I could actually have all of that in one place to make informed decisions, sounds like a world in which I will never live in. Like we can do better, right? And I think we owe it to ourselves to do better. And for the industry to move at the pace that it needs to, we have to do better. And I think that's that's what motivates us at WorkRise to, to really chase and attack this problem. Because we know if we can put that in the hands uh, of the participants in this market, they are going to, it's just going to be this massive unlock. And there's such a desire for it because the pain points are so acute and so real and so maddening. Like that is an incredibly frustrating thing. If you're managing millions of dollars and you're like, <laughs> yeah, I don't actually know who is this money going to, right? Yeah. Like that's a, that's a question. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a legitimate question. I think part of the challenge here too, though, has to be the fact that the services that uh, are required in oil and gas infrastructure, probably true in power, are, are very discreet, very specialized. And so the supply chain itself is actually quite wide uh, because each participant is doing a narrow thing versus uh, right. you know, your generalist uh, contractor. So this creates another layer of hassle or com complexity here because of that. If you, if you like the width of the supply chain, I don't know if that's the right way to characterize it, but that's how I see it. Uh, it's, it's, I, uh, I, it's, it's a problem as well. I, I think you're exactly right. And like to add another layer of complexity in this, I'm sure will resonate. It's like, mm -hmm. and then layer in basin and or geographic complexity, because a lot of these vendors are not just, to your point, hyper specialized in the service that they provide, but they're also hyper specialized in where that they where they provide it. And so what you actually have, which compounds this problem, is a highly fragmented vendor industry with highly specialized and highly localized. Yeah. And so even if you think of some of the big players in the space who have like operations in multiple basins, they don't even get the kind of scale economies, if you will, of being able to be like, oh, I can use this person everywhere. And yeah. so what you end up with. Yeah, they're not in operations there. And I would add even another complexity here, which, which I know bothers um, when I just kind of try, try and find solutions to this that can run across the entire supply chain, is that the participants in the chain are themselves at very different levels of sophistication, complexity, IT awareness. And there are lots of great service providers who run their business on Excel spreadsheets and, and uh, yellow sticky notes. Like it's not out in the field, right? You'd think it'd be quite sophisticated, but it's not. That surely yes. has to stand in the way of, you know, your, your quote, pipe dream, project manager who wants clean visibility to the costs uh, the, and, and monies being spent, but can't actually get at it because the players down you, below are not able to contribute to the data at the velocity that that individual requires. You've hit the nail on the head, right? Uh, I yeah. think if you've been out uh, on a site, you'll know that there's there's someone one day coming in to get all their tickets stamped and approved, yeah. right? Uh, and locks. you go to the trailer. <laughs> yeah, you go, you go to the trailer and you know what this is, how this is going to work. And so having the access and the integration of that information, I think this is one of the pain points you see when you start to see what the existing solutions are that are out in the world. The vendor, generally speaking, is... I don't want to say ignored, but they're not prioritized or like the, the people in the field are not prioritized. These, yeah. these are built in such a way where they're very singular and being like, well, an enterprise solution for like central home corporate office. But that doesn't solve the problem of well, how those inputs, it's garbage in, garbage out. And so if I've got paper tickets that don't, aren't ending up in a system yeah. and they follow a very you know slow and, and, and arduous process, it's no surprise that it takes a quarter to get cost visibility because... The, the, I mean, the industry operates largely off of paper tickets yeah, and the so. industry operates from a new discovery of new vendors perspective, largely off of Rolodexes, right? It's the people I know that I've called before and I'll just call them again. And yeah. so we see a critical, which we have not spoken about yet, a uh, part of the role that we play is actually this discovery capability. Like how yeah. do you actually, you have now, you help to like integrate vendors into a system that is like enables them to be more effective Hopefully, like they can get paid faster. Like there's all these benefits to the vendor side. Exactly. But now all of a sudden you can say, you're also just, how do you become discoverable? Because you might be working with this one operator, but there's four other operators in the same basin that need your services. Like yeah. that is a, and then from a client side, they're having that same problem, which is like, I actually can't find new vendors to diversify my vendor pool, which again, goes back to supply chain 101. There, there's no, there's a real challenge there if you don't have diversity of supply. So we see that being a tremendous unlock to your point to help yeah. to, to alleviate that problem. So, so, so it's just to summarize, right? We have yeah. <laughs> geographic diversity. The big meaty problem. <laughs> yeah, the big meaty problem here, right? We have geographic challenges of trying to get to consolidated answers that work everywhere. Uh, we've got varying levels of sophistication in the supply chain. Uh, we have a very, very slow velocity of data movement up and down. We've got data systems that are on separate rails. How you manage and run the project from an economic lens might be very different from how you do it on a technical lens. So you have these separate separate rails running. Uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a really thorny problem to solve, actually, when you start to really think about it. Um, any sense as to how big the prize might be if you can, you know, once it gets cracked, like what is the waste here that, that the industry is carrying, like a big burden carrying it around with it, uh, with itself? Um, yeah, it's, uh, structures. it's a great question. I can tell you 
what is, the, I mean, I think one interesting data point, what is the amount of money that we think is running through the process that kind of we just discussed and I've just articulated? And even in just like the lower 48, uh, and let's remove kind of like the big vendors, because like there's a, we can have a whole discussion on why like the really big kind of like big, big vendors that these clients are using kind of are treated a little bit differently. Um, but the the rest, like let's call the 80% of the smaller vendors that aren't like, you know, the, driving all of their spend. It's, I mean, we estimate it to be 200 to $400 billion that are running through just that process today. Um, and so you think about being able to give just an, a percentage improvement in the ability yeah. to deploy that capital the dollars are significant, right? And I think in the what you see now from much of the messaging, especially if you're joining earnings calls uh, of some of these operators, the focus on efficiency, and you see it yeah. with M&A and how M&A is emerging yep. as a big theme this year. A lot of it's tied to like, how do we actually drive the efficiencies we've discovered over here into this like new bunch of assets that we're acquiring? Uh, and so we know that like there's the there's the like, you know, the actual extraction, like how you run the drilling program is one thing, mm-hmm. how you actually manage the cost is a whole other bucket of opportunity and upside. And so yeah. I think that's the way we like to look at it. It's like, even if you assume it's a small percentage off of that total spend of savings, yeah. you're still talking billions of dollars that get put it's a, back, right? Because the, 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 the capital intensity in this industry, as everyone listening will know, is just astronomical you would struggle to find a larger one right uh, and so yeah. you, if you can fix that that is a, a huge value add i think to both sides yeah if you could actually extract that value out we could reallocate it into a, a carbon capture projects or a whole bunch of places where that money is probably better spent frankly uh, than that's right uh, than, than doing what we're we're continuing to do has anyone really come close to cracking this problem or cracking the code on this can you are there it, any any stories a, you can share it's a great question uh I, I think what we have seen and i think this is what differentiates us ultimately is that most folks have attacked this through one one point solution that is like throughout the chain so it's like i might attack the invoicing accuracy aspect of it, or I might attack how I think about the deployment and dispatching of like certain services. But what we recognize is that ultimately, until you actually are able to have that kind of golden thread. So think about this from like, I know the compliance of the vendors that I work with. I Mm -hmm. can manage the compliance. So they're like good to go to work. I then think about how I am being able to put those people to work. So how do I engage with those vendors, deploy those vendors? How do I then approve and manage that work once they are live? And then how do I then reliably, because I have all the information I now require, I know what the pricing structure is, I know what the rates are, I know how much they worked and that that work was completed to scope. Mm -hmm. I can now think about how you finish that, which is the payment. That is like, that's the key. And it's a big problem, right? And so like why we believe that we are differentiated is we're taking a holistic view and it's about how you systematically build towards that solution while adding value along the way. Because we know that these pain points still exist even in these single point components of that supply chain. Yeah. But the the huge unlock, and this is what the industry is desperate for, is how you have one solution. And like, it's not atypical for us to be talking to participants in this space where they have nine plus independent systems that they use to manage these various things. And sometimes the systems are even duplicative. Um, And so we know the problem space is real. We know the desire to do it is real. We know it's really, really hard, but we know that this is a problem worth solving because if you can unlock this, as you just said, it enables these clients uh, and these participants in the space to go do magnificent, amazing things that the world so desperately needs. Like there is a, there's a moral element to this, right? And I I firmly believe that oil and gas will play a critical role in the future of our energy landscape and we will not survive without it. And they are motivated to evolve with it. And we're seeing that even as we engage with clients today about how they're thinking about, how can I think about vendors I've never used before? How do I think about geothermal Carbon capture, to your point, is obviously a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting their money where their mouth is now, right? It's not just PR. They're walking the walk. And and we believe there's a huge opportunity to help them a lot. So it raises an angle, though, uh, which is because we've already articulated, if you like, all the challenges, uh, why this is a hard problem to solve. What happens when you walk into an organization and you, and you, you, you put on the table, hey, we believe 
the way you've organized, run your supply chain and, and it's how fragmented it is and the lack of uh, data uh, visibility uh, is what is causing cost challenges for you, uh, efficiency mm -hmm. challenges. What's, what's their reaction when, when you make this observation? Do they go, yeah, 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 we know, but <laughs> is this the, too hard to solve? Or do they say, yeah, and if you can solve this, this, and this, well, you, you've got a story here. It is absolutely the latter. Uh, and that is to say they get very excited. They are, there's healthy kind of, I would call it skepticism to say, this is a really complicated problem. Like, how are you going to solve that? Um, and I think one of the critical things that we understand in this space is that we are an oil and gas company first and foremost. Um, we have an entire business that is focused and dedicated to the people that actually execute the work in the field. And so we understand the pain points in an acute and unique way that I don't think any other kind of technology focused oil and gas company that exists uh, does. Mm -hmm. And so we can spend the time focused on the most critical aspects of like where those pain points manifest. And so what is important to, to understand, and this is what we hear constantly, it's not about displacing the existing incumbents that may provide one of those point solutions because what they really see is like the true value yeah. is if you can solve this end to end problem, I'll concede on some of the other nice to have stuff that may exist in an existing solution because yeah. Yeah. the pain created by that lack of connectivity through that supply chain far outweighs any of the potential benefits they might get from like the current solutions. And so for us, that's incredibly galvanizing. It helps focus how we think about our product roadmap and ultimately enables us to build trust-based partnerships with these clients who we have great relationships with to continue to think about how we're building the right things in the right order to meet their needs and ultimately solve this, this ultimate like you know end-to-end -end problem and solution. Yeah. What does that actually look like? Uh, you're describing it, um, but I'm, I'm curious to know the from a... Uh, just a practical standpoint, uh, a, if an oil operator says, uh, I can't just rip out, you know, 30 of these systems, I can't do that because they're, t they're running the business and that's my cash register, right? It's what, it's what yeah. generates my income. So I can't just stop them. Uh, so, uh, so how do you, like, what, what, is, what does this look like? Is it a layer on top? Is it a new set of rails? Is it one by one hand-to-hand -hand combat with these systems and suppliers and trying moving people onto a common protocol? What, what is it? What is it? Excellent question. And uh, you're pushing on my go-to-market strategy, which perfectly aligns to my background. So the, the simple answer yeah. here. Show me the money, is man. We're look <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And so the, the simple answer is looking for the right pilot partners to test the solution. And so I think, again, going back to what I said a minute ago, the idea of this like singular solution gets clients extremely excited. They're like, this This would be huge for us if that could happen because I am just constantly juggling a myriad oh, yeah. of systems to try yeah. to like get this stuff done. Yeah, you can see. And so there it is would, a, would, wouldn't take much to push someone along to go, yeah, 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 I want that, but I don't know how to get there, right? That's right. That, and that's so the where we, how we walk through that conversation, and I think it's the right way, is you have to like, you have to earn that trust, right? You have to earn for like the, the big ask which is like, okay, now like deploy us everywhere. Yeah. And so the right way to do this, and I think this is the way the industry is it's pragmatic, right? Is like, okay, show me that it works before I'm going to go change everything. Because to your point, there's this is not without quote unquote risk, risk. right? Like from their perspective, they're running projects that cannot be down for a second. And yeah. they need to know that like, you're not going to blow something up, right? Uh, figuratively speaking. And so the way we approach that is through that conversation, which is like, how can we demonstrate to you a use case it gets you excited and like let us walk you through what we have today what road what is coming in the roadmap and here's like the various ways in which we can help you uh during that period of time and so i think what we've seen again is there is a clear willingness to participate in that discussion because yeah, yeah. the pain point is so real and so for them limited downside in trying it in a small in a, a small setting yep. and then we're able to then demonstrate that we can deliver and then we grow with our partners and again I, that's the way i always think about this it's you're growing with them and you want them to see the value that we create yeah i think that's actually a really important point the ability to pilot and trial something in a uh, controlled and narrow way uh, mm -hmm. does mitigate risk because your um an oil company say could could compartmentalize a project 
so that it doesn't get in the way of other initiatives that they're running or, or contaminate their other other programming they've got underway. So I think that's actually that's really right. key is figuring out the pilot. I suppose choosing where you start with your with in terms of thinking this through uh, is actually a critical value point because you're going to yeah. want to you're going to aim for success. Clearly, you're going to be looking for parts of the organization that are, you know, ripe. In other words, they got to be they got to be keen to do something. You're going to need supply chain partners who are equally motivated. Is that the is that how you work your way through this? How, or or is there some other criteria that I'm I'm not thinking about here? No, I think that's I think that's correct. Uh, the other piece that I would speak to is like we understand the criticality of how we think about like the supply side liquidity, if you will. So like if we're going to go help support um, an operator, again, it goes back to how you how many ways you can slice the the vendor universe, right? And so we try to be very intentional about where we're building out the right relationships with the right vendors in the right spend categories and service categories that we can then deliver that type of value to those clients. And that's where we see it is a partnership on both sides of this ecosystem. Like you can't, you can't, if you over index on one, you do it at the expense of the other and both participants are critically important. And so yeah. we think about that balance and how we pick pilot partners and how we, how we prioritize which operators and like which clients to like go speak to with like, how are we also able feeling confident that we can like deliver that value and make sure the vendor experience is also a positive one. Right. Uh, Cause when that imbalance happens, one of those sides is losing either. Like you have too many, Vendors that are like, well, where, what am I doing here? Like, there's nothing to do. Or you have clients who are like, there's no vendors and this is a terrible experience. And so that's where, again, we go to really think about how you can be pointed and targeted with that strategy and how you can kind of like serve both like the commercial requirements of our business while also thinking about the value creation on both sides for clients and vendors. Yeah. And so I think, I think you've nailed it with that regard. It's being focused. It's being targeted. We have a great like internal operations team that is all uh, oil and gas folks. And so we're able to, I think, effectively balance that conversation and make sure that we're we're not getting ahead of our skis, if you will, and yeah. to bring a bad experience. So, uh, what what are the sorts of um, futures that you're you're, you're anticipating here? Uh, and because of the stuff that I watch, for instance, uh, is this in industrial consolidation does mean mm -hmm. uh, scale economies to be captured by the mm -hmm. buyers. Uh, yeah. So it means that uh, some companies are going to be under real pressure to perform at the moment. Uh, it uh, it means um, as we do energy transition and adopt new energy, we've got less and less people and service companies even requ should be required in this industry. So there's a real there's a real long game here, which which argues for a shrinking and plateauing, and therefore it has to become even more efficient than it already is. How how do you characterize when people talk to you about where are you going with your you know your, yeah. your solution? How do you how do you articulate that vision given though that sort of industrial context? Yeah, uh, I actually think that is an incredible use case and a powerful example of like why what we're building is actually so critical. So if you think about M and A, um, which you called out there, and what happens as these two companies come together, what you have is this consolidation of actually massive vendor lists, um, right? Because these two companies are probably operating likely differently, uh, and in a lot of these cases. There's like to your point, vendors are struggling now to actually keep up with um, the, the demand for their services to some extent because it's becoming harder and harder to continue to keep up with like the pace of the industry. And so one of the challenges we see usually of the acquirer is how do I actually sift through all of this, right? To unlock and realize the value or like, you know, the investment thesis that we kind of predicated the entire acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is actually M&A is an incredibly powerful use case for why having um, what we have started to build at their disposal, because they can quickly sift through who's being used for what rates, how often, like who are the ones I need to keep? Who are the ones that actually haven't been used in a while? Yeah. Because as you, I'm sure will know, it costs like internal supply chain money to maintain these vendor lists, right? And so you're even just from a compliance perspective, even some of these vendors who they call out once or twice a year, mm -hmm. there's still the same internal supply chain burden to make sure like they're good to go to work. And so we actually believe that M&A is like a force multiplier for like why you need these types of systems yeah. um, because that lack of data then creates this real hole or I should say drag on the speed at which they can realize the 
the return on, on that investment from the M&A exercise. So yeah. we get very excited about that because we think there's like, and we have demonstrated examples of helping companies through that um, as they work through acquisition because of that, that cleaning up on the vendor list is, is a pretty cumbersome. It's it's a pain. It's a pain. I, I was personally involved in just one. Uh, we started at 20,000 <laughs> vendors and got it down to 2,000. So 18,000 yeah. 18, companies, unfortunately, were rationalized out. Now, a big chunk of those uh, vendors turned out to be charities that the, the company was sending money to. So even the charities got shrunk down in terms of the shareholders. Right. So this is a it's a big it's a big moment actually for the industry because we are going through a wave of consolidation here that'll we'll drive, I, drive I, change here. I agree completely, and then I'd yeah. be remiss by not speaking to our like the consultant side of our business and so what we do there is that we actually employ a tremendous amount uh, of the consultants that operate uh, in this industry and so we know that like you can see it right like rig counts are down but production is at an all-time high that translates directly to job cuts right and efficiencies that are being realized in operations and so i think one of the longer you kind of talk about vision like longer term kind of like calls to action is you have a bunch of incredibly talented folks in businesses, whether they're a company of one mm -hmm. or they're a company of a hundred who are looking for ways to add value with critical skills that they built over a career. And so that lack of kind of a marketplace for them to figure out how they continue to evolve and deploy and sell like their, their capabilities as the industry evolves, we believe is like a, is almost like a, a moral obligation for us to continue to create the space for those people to go along with the industry because they've done all they can uh, through good times and bad and through being ostracized and villainized, they continue to show up, right? And I think for us, we look at that as an opportunity to continue to help these two sides evolve as like the industry evolves, right? And I, I think that that's something that it keeps me up at night knowing that like to your point, like the, it's getting harder and harder to, to kind of bring people into the industry and to keep them yeah. there. Uh, and so we, but we know that that talent drain is going to cost us dearly uh, in terms of the energy transition in the future. So um, having to support that through like, you know, the, the network that we're building in that marketplace will be just so important uh, as we move forward. Josh, this has been a great uh, discussion on supply chain transformation, the role of the ecosystem, the challenges this industry faces. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. No, this was great. I really appreciated the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for the time. 